Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for that praise, ladies. The joy meter has gone to about 60% in the congregation now. Hopefully we'll get all the way. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open them to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 26 and 27 today. Sermon is titled, You Mad Bro? Maybe you are. All of us will be at some time or another. We're going to see what God has to say about that today. This is not what you would call a historical Christmas time sermon. I just simply haven't done a Christmas series this year. Uh, don't fear, you'll get one next Sunday, it'll all be okay. But maybe learning how to handle anger can help us to handle the holidays. I mean, I know nobody gets mad with, you know, in-laws coming in and family and everything else like that. Some of us just really embrace the holiday season, uh, particularly. But uh, we're going to see how God wants us to handle Anger at Christmas time or any other time. Let's look here, Ephesians chapter 4, and let's pick up here at verse 26. God says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning as a people who all struggle with anger in some fashion or form. God, I pray that you would show us today the proper way to be angry and how to handle it in your spirit and to use it in such a way that we do not give Satan a place in our lives. Father, we see how much damage anger can do in individual lives, in families, and in churches. And we do not want that for ourselves. So teach us today and train us and show us that we have been liberated by the blood of Christ from handling things in a fleshly way. And we have been liberated by your spirit to live in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and righteousness. So teach us today, we pray, and lead our hearts to you. And may we be ready today to hand all of our anger over to you, to lay it at your feet, to take it off and to have it to be dissolved through your blood and your spirit. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Sometime years ago, the sailors arrived on a tropical island. They were hungry, they were thirsty, and they looked at the trees of the island and they saw coconuts in those trees. And they realized that the coconuts would take care of both their thirst and their hunger. But there was just one problem. Between them and the coconuts were a bunch of monkeys that were none too happy to have humans getting on their trees to try to get their coconuts. But the matter they made the monkeys, guess what happened? Those monkeys would grab those coconuts and fling them down. And the sailors realized, hey, if we just keep making these monkeys mad, they're going to keep giving us the coconuts that we walk. That's exactly what they did. Anger was the genius means of the sailors getting what they wanted. And friend, anger is the genius means of Satan getting what he wants from you and from me. But God gives us this word today. That we can all be aware of the danger of anger before us and by his grace turn this dangerous situation into an opportunity to glorify God. Listen, folks, we're all going to be angry in this life. <laughs> we're all going to have anger issues. Even the kindest, gentlest person among us knows the emotion of anger. If you are not angry and you do not get mad, it is simply because you are not paying attention to the things of this world. But what we see in God's word is that if our anger is not dealt with quickly and in a righteous way, it will fester in our hearts and lead us to serve Satan by giving him a place in our lives. It is the way of the world and the way of our old lives to live in anger and to play God with our tempers and our outbursts and our schemes. But We've been made new in Christ. 
to live a new way of real peace and strength. That is, as it is written in James, the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. Moses did not accomplish the righteousness of God when in anger he took his staff and he cracked it on the rock. You remember that, don't you? Israel, they're all behind him like a bunch of little babies. Wah, wah, we need water, we need water. And God says, I'll tell you what, Moses, you speak to that rock. You speak to it. And water will gush out of it, and I will give my people water. Well, Moses has had enough of this. I, I know this will be hard uh, to believe, but sometimes it is difficult to shepherd the people of God. And he was fed up with it. And here they are whining, give us water. And he's like, you want water? I'm going to give you water. And he takes his staff and he cracks that rock. That water comes gushing out. In his anger, he satisfied himself. Instead of satisfying the glory of God by speaking to that rock. And that sin barred him from entering the promised land with Israel. Right. Anger is no joke. And Moses sitting alone in the Bible. We really don't have the time right here to go into all the anger issues of the people of God we find in the Bible. But all of them had it. And all of us, quite frankly, have it beginning with me. But the good news is that all things are possible through Christ who enables us to put our anger away quickly for the good of our souls and for the glory of his name. So let's break this down as we look to God's word and we see first today examining our... When Paul tells us to be angry and do not sin, he is borrowing there from words of King David in Psalm chapter 4 and verse 4. That's what David said. What was happening is a lot of his accusers were just making up malicious lies about him. And David knew that his followers or his supporters would want to take matters into their own hands. So David tells them, he says, be angry, but don't do something stupid. He says, be angry, but don't do something that is going to cost you dear in your life. Be angry, but don't play God in trying to get vengeance on those who are making up these things about me. And Paul borrows that phraseology and he tells us, be angry. Listen, there are things to be angry about in this life, but don't allow it to infest your heart to the point that you are fundamentally changed from the person that God has made you to be. That's deep, isn't it? <laughs> and that really puts our anger into perspective. It can utterly change us into someone God isn't making us to be. So might I just ask the question here, has that happened? you do you find that you have a great bitterness towards others that your temper easily flares up that your relationships are strained because of your anger and your temper has it affected your relationship to your spouse your kids your church family and everyone in between may god grant us the grace to break those chains and to help us understand that anger is an emotion in and of itself, anger isn't sinful or righteous. It is an emotion, and emotions have one purpose. They spur us on to action. And the action that we take from our anger, that can be sinful or that can be righteous. In the Bible, we often find times that Jesus was angry, but he was never sinful. For example, one time the the Pharisees are gathered around Jesus like a bunch of hyenas licking their chops to eat their prey. It is the Sabbath day, and lo and behold, a man with a withered hand, a crippled hand, has come to Jesus. And man, they're watching. 
they're watching. Will he heal on the Sabbath day? Will this be our chance to finally tear him down and break him for breaking our man-made rules? Will this be the time? And Jesus knows what's in their mind. And the Bible says that he was angry. He says, after looking around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored. What a glorious, wonderful, God-honoring miracle that Jesus just did. It's the type of thing that should make everyone in the room take a moment and say, praise God for his great grace and power and love. But not so much. Not so much with the Pharisee. <clears throat> they didn't care about anything except to them the breaking of their laws that they had placed above the law of Moses. And Jesus was angry about it. He was equally angry, you remember, when he went to the temple complex one day. And everybody is there making a big trade, making a big production, making a big business out of honoring God. They're selling animals. They're taking money in. And he was angry in his heart about it. And he drove them out with a whip. <laughs> so the next time somebody asks you, what would Jesus do? Be sure to remember that driving people out with a whip isn't out of the question. Don't take that right. <laughs> but Jesus was angry about it. In other places of the Bible, we find that God was angry with Balaam for wanting money to curse Israel. He was angry with Israel for joining themselves to Baal, he, uh, an idolatrous false god, and on and on and on the list goes. Now, folks, American Christianity has done just about everything we can possibly do to tell people that our God is not an angry God. That is a blatant lie. I personally believe in a God who is perfect, loving, merciful, jealous, and angry. Because I see that God in the Bible. And his connection to anger shows us that anger is both unavoidable and it's also not sinful. It's what we do with it that we can make it useful to our sanctification or harmful to us and others. And this brings us to see that anger is an emotion that spurs us on to action, just like any other emotion that we face. For example, with God, God is furious with sinners. Furious at those that transgress his word and trample on his decrees. He is furious that has not been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have a sinner in the hands of an angry God. And you're going to say, well, pastor, is he loving? Absolutely he's loving. Absolutely he's loving. Absolutely he's merciful. Absolutely he's gracious. I mean, he gave his very son, his very blood for that sinner to be forgiven. But if they will not turn from their sin and put their faith in him, he is furious with them. And how does he deal with that? He makes them answer for their crimes against him being an eternal God, eternally in hell. His anger spurs him on to action that way. Anger moves us to action. This is a specific action that Paul calls us to take. Listen closely. Be angry. It's going to happen. But do not sin. Be angry, but do not sin. And friends, this is where you and I must be ever so careful. We can often be angered about something that goes against God's righteousness and then justify our actions because of it. Did you hear me on that one? You can be angry about something you should be angered about, but if you're not careful, you will justify your sinful actions by it. Let me give you a case in point. You remember Jacob from the Old Testament, right? Jacob had sons and he had a daughter. And one day in the land of Shechem, and the king of Shechem's son comes and 
rapes Jacob's daughter. And his sons, righteously, understandably, are angry about their sister being defiled. That's okay. They should be angry about that. It is an injustice. It is an outrage. They should be angry. But here's what they do. They go to the men of Shechem and they say, Prince, we will give you our sister as a bride. But here's the thing. We don't give our people to uncircumcised people. So all of your men have to be circumcised. And the order is given for everybody to be circumcised. And while the men are recovering from their circumcision, the sons of Jacob go into the cat town and kill every last man in it. You see how that worked? They were righteously angry. They were right to be angry about her rape, but they took it in a way that they let their anger lead to sin. And God is saying, be angry, but do not sin. So we have to be careful of that. You remember Cain, don't you? Cain gave offerings to God. His brother Abel gave <laughs> offerings to God. Abel gave his very best, so God received his offering. Cain did not give his very best, so God did not receive his offering. And Cain gets ticked. And who about it? His brother. Right? That makes sense. I mean, not mad at God. Not mad at yourself. Get mad at your brother. And in Cain's mind, the way that this gets fixed is by getting rid of Abel. And God comes to me. And God says, son, you need to know that you have no reason to be angry. If you do right, your offering will be received just like Abel's was. And God told him, God said, sin is crouching at the door. It is like a lion behind that door. And if you open this door, he is going to pounce on you. And God said, you better master your sin. And he did it. He opened that door, the lion come out, and he killed his brother for it. He was angry unjustly, and that was an unrighteous action. That's where the unsinful emotion of anger turns into sin. We make this all about us. We make it about our pleasure. We make it about our pride. We make it about our ego. We make it about our comfort. It is narcissism. Self-focus, self-centeredness at its finest. And I want us to really see what God is saying here. It doesn't matter whether the issue causing us to be angry is necessarily righteous or unrighteous. That's not the problem. The problem is you better deal with it and deal with it right now. In other words, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And don't be thinking if somebody ticks you off in the morning that it's okay to be mad all the way through the day by the time the sun falls. That's not what that means. What that is saying is get over your anger and get over it right now. Take it to God and deal with it quickly. Don't let it fester. Don't let it build. If it is not quickly, prayerfully, instantly dealt with, it grows inside us to the point that everything and everyone in our lives becomes affected by it. I can promise you that the lady that goes to work and becomes angry at somebody at work, she will bring, if she does not deal with it quickly, she will bring that anger home to her husband and her family. And it will impact everything in their lives. And it will of the family because the family doesn't really understand what they're supposed to be angry about. They just know they're mad. So you've got kids that leave the house now and they are angry, but they don't have a clue as to what. They just know they should be angry about something. And they go to school and there's anger problems. And the teacher calls, how little Jimmy, it seems like he has an anger problem. Yeah. Why? We don't know. It's because somebody didn't get over their anger quickly. The man that goes to work in the same position, it will happen to him as well. And for we as Christians, guess what? All of that will come home to roost in the church. 
family of God. If you if you've paid attention, you may have noticed that some folks just simply cannot ever seem to be at peace in the church. That's because they're not. They have unchecked anger that they have not let God deal with. And they have let it spill out to everyone like the slow moving death of a volcano. Christian, check yourself. Are you mad over that which God is mad about? And are you, are you handling it in a godly way? Or are you mad over what you choose to be mad about? And you're handling it like a toddler that has had his toy taken away. Now let's go from examining our anger to seeing, secondly today, extinguishing our anger. Paul says, be angry, do not sin, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Regardless of whether you are angry with a righteous indignation or angry from your flesh, we all must deal with that indecisively. Don't let it stew. Don't bottle it up. Give it to God. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. So if we accept the fact that we all have anger issues, and you do, we need, as Christ people, to seek a way of extinguishing that anger, of dealing with it quickly, which is what the word means. Do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. You know, there was a group of ancient people called the... Uh, Pythagoreans, and they had this tribal rule that if they was mad at somebody, they would not let the sun go down before they shook hands with them, them that day. In other words, they knew they had to get over it. They knew they had to deal with it quickly, and, and God is looking at you and me and saying, do that same thing. It is part of our old life, friend. It is part of the old life. To hold on to anger and tempers and grudges and bitterness. The blood of Christ has freed us from those chains of slavery. And his spirit has brought us into a new life and empowered us to live by it. Believe it, folks. Listen, sometimes we don't hear ourselves speak. Have you ever, ever noticed how people like to justify their anger? Well, I'm only human. No, no, that should not fly in the family of God. Why don't we ever say, well, you know, I just remain ticked off all the time, but I'm only Christian. We never say that, do we? But we will say I'm only human. No, you are Christian. You're a Christian. And some people like to say, well, I can't help it. I just got a short fuse. You know what else has a short fuse? Dynamite. <laughs> All right, this is my friend. You know, things just bother me and they irritate me and I just, I, I just bottle them up and they build up and then I just vent it all out at once and I'm done and I feel better. You know what else works that way? A shotgun shell. You ignite the gunpowder, the gases build up, it pushes the projectile out the barrel, but the gun doesn't say, man, I feel so much better. <laughs> we, we really should listen to the things that we say. Because, dear Christian, you and I can. Amen. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we start by removing self. And we all just need to own up to the fact that when we let our anger go unchecked, it's because we are making something about us. That's why we get personally offended. That we are called in Scripture to live our lives in this way. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus would tell us in the New Testament, you love each other as I love you. Did you notice what was absent? from those commands, those scriptures. You were absent from it. We're to love God supremely with all that we are. His love is to go out from us to one another, to this world. 
But Jesus never mentioned self-love. Get it? So get this. Our anger actually comes from a point of love. That's not necessarily a good thing. It's kind of like this. If you get angry over the things that offend God because you love God, that's good. Or if you get angry with things that affect the church negatively because you love the church, that's good. But a lot of times, we for what? Things that affect me. Therefore, I know that my love is most supremely to whom? Me. Amen. I noticed I only got one amen on that. <laughs> <laughs> that is a stinging reality, isn't it? Yeah. Remember Jonah in the Bible, the prophet. Jonah was called of God to go to the Ninevites, a historic enemy of Israel, a pagan people, and to deliver them the gospel of salvation. Sounds great, right? It ticked Jonah off. He did not want to be known as the prophet that brought salvation to the Ninevites. He did so much that he tried to kill himself. Remember, he jumped off a boat in a storm, hoping to die. The God didn't let him die. Swallowed by a big fish. Puked up on the shores of Nineveh. <laughs> and he begrudgingly, with no joy, reluctantly did like God said. Okay, yeah. All right, you heathens turn to God. He walked away. 120,000 people. Get that. 120,000 people turned to God, repented in dust and ashes, and just in case, not only did the people repent in dust, ashes, and sackcloth, animals do it too. They were serious about turning to the God of Israel. And if that was in a bad, I mean, 120,000, man, that's a big number. If that happened in Woodsfield, we would be known the SBC over for the rest of our life. <laughs> Woodsfield revival, man. We'd be having people come in here writing books. What's your secret, man? What's happening? Jonah could not have cared less. He was so in love with himself. <laughs> the day come that God actually <laughs> grew a plant over him to give him shade from the scorching heat. He loved that, but when the plant went away, man, he was furious. The Bible says he was furious that the plant had died. And God comes to him and he says, Jonah, should, should I be more concerned about a plant that dies for your discomfort than the eternal salvation of 120,000 people? The prophet still didn't get it. It was all about him. All the anger you see in Jonah is because he could only think of himself. Now, brace yourselves, because this might hurt, but this is largely our case, isn't it? I mean, there are injustices going on all over the world. We have dictators running around, suppressing people, putting them under thumb, Locking up Christians in cargo containers to the point that there's so many stuff in there they can't sit down. They have to use the bathroom where they stand. People are going hungry because evil governments are withholding food from them. We should be outraged. We should look at that and say, that makes me angry, that injustice. But it doesn't bother us near as much. As the guy that takes the parking lot that we've been setting for two minutes to get. True. Man, I, I had a guy the other day. Oh my. 
I forget what Walmart we was at. We do we do at least one Walmart run every week. Using word and wind. <laughs> but I, I'm I'm sitting waiting for this person to come and back out. Uh, this guy looks to me like he is parked, and uh, the car backs out, and I pull in there. Now he he pulls ahead of me, okay, like in the parking lot up for me. So he actually has one up on me. And he gets out and he just starts in. I have been waiting for that parking lot for five minutes and you just pulled in there like I was never there and blah, 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 blah. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, hmm, somebody needs Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just tell him, expecting that this conversation is going to go on. I said, man, I am so sorry. And I did good, y'all. I did real good. He has the parking spot ahead of me. I so wanted to ask him, do you want to trade? And I did not. I was good. And I just said, man, I am, I am so very sorry about that. And in my naivete, I thought that was going to lead to a gospel conversation, but it did just the opposite. He just sort of looked at me and he said, no, you're not, and just storms right into Walmart. <laughs> okay. Anger. We make it about us. We all have need to examine ourselves, to think of our Lord's words. You have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, but whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to hell fire. God says it's a matter of the heart. Live, love God's way, and you'll give that anger up quickly. And with removing yourself from the equation, we can then rest in the spirit. And this is the antidote to ongoing anger, that we might know peace and happiness and joy. And these all come from the fruit of the spirit whose life we have been given. Listen to this from the book of Galatians chapter 5. Paul tells us, that part of the works of our old life in the flesh, notice how many of these are connected to anger, are enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, and envy. All of those kind of have a root where? Anger. Now, on the other hand, when we yield control of our lives to the Spirit, here's the fruit, the character traits of God that come through our lives. Love, joy, peace, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And here's how you can absolutely know that you can do this. So none of us can say, I'm just human. None of us can say, I've just got a short fuse. None of us can say any of that. Paul says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It's already happened. You have it. The question is, will we appropriate it to not live in anger? And when you remove yourself and rest in the spirit with your anger, you will be removed from Satan's grip. Not giving him an opportunity, not giving him place in your life. And of course, no place in the people of Christ. He'll have no place in the church of Christ either. And we all must make sure he finds no place here. How many folks Stay away from Christians because of the anger that runs through us. How many churches have been divided because of the anger that the sun went down on and it festered and it built and it transformed somebody that God had released from that through the blood of Jesus Christ and the spirit given to them. How many times? Don't be a pawn of Satan. Why? Because you're strong in Christ. You don't have to be that. The blood of Jesus Christ was not shed to serve Satan, but to serve him. And that blood cleanses us of all sin to the degree that we can be free from all the anger that would enslave us to live for him. So, you mad, bro? <coughs> you mad, sister? <coughs> And you got anger issues you need to take to Jesus right here and right now. 
Is there a healing that needs to occur in your heart, in your life? You're looking at yourself and saying, I get it now. I have changed myself into somebody that God did not make me to be. You can drop it all by doing this. Be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. This is the time and this is the place to lay it all. All at the feet. Let's pray. Lord, I ask you to take our hearts now to empty them of anger from whatever source, from whatever has happened. Cleanse us of it to live in your joy and your peace that we would not give place to Satan in our lives, but place only to you. Rule us, we pray. And in this invitation, God, I just extend this prayer out to all of the people here today, beginning with myself. Help us, God, as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> Your eyes upon Jesus, love for it. with me just for a moment just bow your heads in prayer and I'm just going to ask you if in your heart and in your life you need to have less self-love more love for God more love for others and to lay your anger at Christ to live righteously in him if you would just think about that for a moment maybe raise your hand so I can pray for you specifically and do it just take it to our Lord in prayer I know in my heart I'm one of them thank you sister Amen. 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 Father, I lift us all up who battle with this and struggle with this. And God, we are thankful for your word. And we just pray that your word would work upon our hearts today in a mighty and powerful way to put us 
in the being people that love you with all that we am and through that love love others that we would empty our lives of ourselves to not take personal offense but to live being able to be angry at that which angers you but not sin thank you for all that struggle with this bless us as only you can and we pray all of you in jesus name amen hope to see you back here tonight friends at 6 30 may god be with you take care hey and afterwards Oh yeah, party after the play. Party My friend Branson, you know, 